All right. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Guy McPherson, joined by Peter Miller for the third time in relatively recent history. And hopefully we'll do a few or maybe many more of these, depending upon our interest level and the interest level of the people watching. Mm -hmm. So, Peter, you want to get us started? Yes, sir. Um, so, again, I'm Peter. I'm from uh, Canada, Alberta. And um, uh, also as part of this uh, undertaking and these meetings and explorations with Guy, I'm sharing my my mental health course at uh, freebpdcourse.com. I'll mention a little bit more later, but just wanted to say that at the outset. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and there, will, okay. there will be a link to that course just beneath this video. So if you look in the description here, you can click on that and it'll take you right to the course. Sorry. No problem. Um, so I'm um, as these uh, videos are occurring, I'm I'm going through some of this the discussions I've had with Guy in the past and trying to um, uh, sort of reassemble a little bit and also maybe improve upon because um, we we've both grown and learned things since uh, that time and and one of the one of the best videos I think Guy ever produced was uh, when he did um, near term human extinction in under four minutes uh and uh I, I wanted to see if i could do it uh like uh, in my own way <laughs> probably definitely not as cool not as like on, on point and missing some important people and dates but okay here by it goes the, by so, the way by the way before you start yeah. just to clarify i'm not predicting near-term human extinction will occur in less than four minutes i described it in less than right. four minutes. <laughs> right yes <laughs> I was hoping that goes without saying. <laughs> okay, so the way I understand it, and it, it did take me a little bit to grasp it all uh, as I met Guy in, initially, but so uh, ever since humans have been uh, working and tilling the earth, they have been uh, creating somewhat of a heat engine. So like they have been emitting CO2 into the atmosphere in various ways and in much smaller degrees when, you know, thousands of years ago when we were just getting started out. But then once the industrial revolution hit and kind of the, the sociopaths took, took much of control of resources and the means of production and so forth, the emissions of CO2 started to skyrocket on a regular basis, not just like a volcano going off once in a while, but, you know, producing like the, the Ford factory and then all the other car factories and then all the other uh, things that we create and then dispose of. It started to escalate and sort of compound. And ever since the Industrial Revolution in the, where, the end of the 1800s, somewhere in there, it just sort of kept on going up and up and up. So we have been emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere uh, at, a, at a, a, a fast pace ever since then and never stopped. And that has uh increased the overall uh, heat and average of um, our average heat. And it's been measured in Hawaii at the mountaintop there. I can't remember the name, but so the parts per million, we can track that. And we can also see how that aligns uh, with different events and things that happen, uh, catastrophes and, and, you know, towns burning down and all the other uh, flash flooding and related things. So we have been doing that uh, on a large scale for a long time. And at the same time, we have been uh, putting waste uh, into the atmosphere of particulates, which has created somewhat of an umbrella and which has strangely protected us from some of the, the, uh, the heat of the sun. So at the same time as we're creating waste, we're also in a strange way protecting ourselves. But eventually the heat is gonna go up to a point where we can't maintain industrial civilization, it will eventually collapse. And then when that collapses, the, the, the blanket or the umbrella will also fall and then the heat will um, go up exponentially after that and it will be game over very shortly. How did I do? <laughs> very, very well. I just wanna clarify a couple of things. <laughs> okay. Most people say that the industrial revolution began about 1750. And if we say, 1850 or late 1800s that adds or that subtracts 0.2 degrees c so it doesn't sound like a big difference but every tenth of a degree matters so if we go back to approximately the mid 1700s 
1750 or so. That's better. And the observatory you're thinking of, the U.S. National Observatory, is at Mauna Loa, right. Hawaii. Yeah. And one of only two national observatories. The other is Kit, Kit Peak National Observatory on Kit Peak, just outside of Tucson, Arizona. I lived in Tucson for 20 years. And before I got there in 1989, the city had also put into practice and into law the reduction in lighting and places for example like street lights streets are, so here's a street light they always had a cover over them so that the light didn't go up into the atmosphere and cause light pollution and that's because kit peak was nearby as little light was was needed as was possible and so that was really interesting because Tucson's the only major city, more than a million people, that I've been to where you walk in the streets at night and it's dark. Right? And and nobody feels like they're in danger because it's just essentially always been that way. Whereas you go to most cities, you're walking around at dark, you're thinking something something could go wrong here. Mm-hmm. Mm. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> So and it and and uh, a viewer of yours did kind of suggest the 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 tag name the, the McPherson paradox, which is kind of cool. Um, yes. So you know, it sort of is something that can be, I don't know, a bit of a shorthand, I guess, for that that way of looking at things. And and I mean, part of my discussions and with you has been trying to get like how you are pulling from all the peer reviewed literature. Like you don't pull from, you pull from like um, legitimate sources, and yet we see that the other scientists, for some reason, are not willing to talk about this global dimming. And I've just been baffled, and I think you have too. But maybe we could elaborate on that some more. I frequently refer to it as the best kept secret in climate science, because no paid clim- climate scientist will talk about it. And in fact. I was reading a December 2011 paper by James Hansen and colleagues and a peer reviewed paper. And this is where I first came across the idea. And twice in this paper, they say this is the first attempt to evaluate the aerosol masking effect or global dimming. And I thought, well, this must be the first paper then, December 2011. It was only later that a longtime college and university librarian who who died about this time last year became a friend. And he pointed out that there were peer-reviewed paper, papers going back to 1929. So he pointed to a paper by Anders Angstrom, which is quite a name for a scientist. Yeah. That's a that's a unit of measure. A tiny oh, I didn't know. Okay, okay. Yeah, so Anders Angstrom uh, wrote this paper about aerosol masking, and amazingly, the December two thousand eleven paper by Hansen and colleagues indicated almost exactly the same level of masking, the same level of dimming as Angstrom had in nineteen twenty nine, which is a long time before two thousand eleven. Hmm. So Amazing. why why are you the only one who will talk about like it's it's in the peer reviewed literature right it's not yes. like you're make it's not like you're just pulling from some YouTube video like right and and it's not just that 1929 paper and it's not the 2011 paper there's more than two dozen papers before the 2011 paper by Hansen and colleagues more than two dozen pointed out to me by Jackson Davis this individual who was a librarian later became a friend. I think people don't talk about it. Oh, here's an example. Yesterday, like almost every day, I received a link to a YouTube video from somebody, somebody I don't even know. And and they write, I think this is a great overview of the situation in only 12 or 15 or 35 minutes or whatever it is, because it's always way longer than I have time for. <laughs> and it, I think it presents a great, great overview. And so I watched most of it sort of skipping through when somebody would be talking, blah, 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 about one topic for a long time. I'd skip through those parts. <clears throat> no mention of aerosol masking. None. Nobody ever talks about it. Why? I don't really know. 
maybe paid climate scientists think if they tell people about aerosol masking that people will decide they don't need to conserve anymore? I don't know. It's got to be the most taboo thing because as soon as you add that piece, I, th I think there's a level of accountability people don't want to talk about. Um, uh, because then you know it's it's a predicament at that point, right? Uh, right. And then and then you know that if the major polluters or the world or whatever the richest people, if they didn't combine all their resources to try and clean up their mess, which they don't want to do, because they don't want to lower their bottom line or upset their investors or whatever, right? So as if you talk truthfully, then um, people would have to face that. And since we kind of live in a system of lies and bullshit i mean it wouldn't work anymore right right and you know that's an excellent point i don't know why nobody almost nobody is willing to talk about it occasionally i'll see something in a newspaper washington post or the guardian they never call it by its name they've never mentioned the aerosol masking effect but relatively recently people have started talking about shipping lanes or shipping tracks and most notably in the atlantic ocean and the bunker fuel that those ships are using to move all this material around the world that bunker fuel creates an enormous amount of reflective particles of these aerosols that go up into the upper atmosphere and reflect so relatively recently i can't remember exactly when in the last two or three years there have been new standards put in place they have to use different fuel or they have to use less bunker fuel than they were using before. And so there's been this profound increase in temperature over the Atlantic Ocean within the last two years. And that's specifically because of loss of aerosol masking. Mm -hmm. And occasionally an article write about it, you know, in the, in the corporate media, like the New York Times or whatever, they'll write about it. They'll never mention the aerosol masking effect. They don't refer to it as global dimming, but they point out the paradox that is that we must reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But if we do, we also reduce these aerosols, the, the particles that reflect back the sunlight before it hits the earth and warms it up. So it's a mess. How do we deal with a mess? I've been arguing for a long time that you and I and the plebes in general, the, the, the mass of humanity has, there, there's very little we can do in response. You know, currently it's approximately 8 billion people who are trying to be careful, who are trying to conserve fossil fuels and a hundred or so people who are maintaining aerosol masking. That's the billionaires, the people who I think we talked about this once before, people who when they fly their, their company jet, they fly two company jets and one goes out in front of the one they're on so that they can detect air pockets, turbulence, so they oh, can wow. report back to the billionaire that they need to go around. Right. <laughs> so, so we have billionaires like that who are maintaining aerosol masking, obviously, and the rest of us. And, it, and it's this delicate balance. Right. I mean. All, all we had to do, and we mean society, is change the bunker fuel in these cargo ships, and bam, there's a profound, very detectable increase in temperature, especially over the Atlantic Ocean, where all these ships were traveling and carrying goods. So, so it's what out they, there. Uh... What do they call that yearly conference again? COP something? What is it? Yeah, it's called the Conference of Parties. And they, it's referred to as COP? Like, is that yeah. what they say? Yeah. yeah I have so an idea. We need to go there and protest with some signs that say, why aren't you talking about global dimming? Um, I, have they ever talked about that there? Not to my knowledge. It's as taboo there as it is anywhere. And bear in mind that these conferences, place, they take place in in really nice places people from all over the world fly to whatever right london dubai egypt nice places nice vacation mm -hmm. for 
climate mm-hmm. scientists and their families. Mm-hmm. And 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 they spend days and every presentation, every panel, they talk about how we're going to get the plebes to reduce the use of fossil fuels. Every mm-hmm. single one. <laughs> I think we should talk a little bit more about how impossible it's going to be to turn this ship around. Um, uh, I think if I put out a couple of things, we can imagine how impossible it will be to turn the ship around. So one of the big things I mentioned already was, okay, one of the things that needs to occur, like if there was to be a fantasy solution, would be to adjust the chemicals in the atmosphere, right? So you would need to clean up or actually try and balance that the atmosphere, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So that would take some kind of uninvented technology, some kind of massive investment, monetary investment, to uh, try something, right? So uh, that's the kind of, would you say that's the one of the top five things that would need to occur that won't occur? Absolutely. In, in fact, we have an example, right? Dr. Ye Tao at Harvard when he was doing his postdoctoral research there came up with the mirror reflection framework. MIR is M-E-E-R, mirrors for Earth's energy rebalancing. And it you can find it at mirror.org, M-E-E-R.org. And he Dr. Tao is currently, oh, let's see, he was in Africa for a little over a month setting up examples demonstrating how to do this and in a storage shed on this property we have a set of those mirrors in the infrastructure to go with it so that we can do this here or someplace near here still looking for an exact location because our very small property is very shady most of the time so Mm. it might not be an ideal location Mm -hmm. in any event I think this is the most reasonable approach that I've heard about. Uh, Dr. Tao is a physicist, and he understands climate change. So this is relatively simple physics. Before the sunlight can strike the Earth and warm it up, if we reflect it back up with mirrors, thus the mirrors for Earth's energy rebalancing, if we can reflect that back up into the atmosphere before it warms the planet, then that's a huge win, right? The downside is a relatively recent evaluation of the surface area of mirrors that is required would be enormous, like the size of the United States. It's basically replacing ice, right? Yes. Yes, the ice is rapidly disappearing from both poles and what's sometimes called the third pole, the Himalayas. And so we're losing all that ice, all that reflective material or albedo. And this is a a means by which we can replace that ice with some of the most abundant material on Earth, sand. Sand is what it takes to make glass and to make mirrors. So, you know, on the face of it, it seems like it's, certainly not impossible and actually is a heck of a lot more pragmatic than losing habitat for our species. You know, I think most people time, right. But it still wouldn't solve the whole problem. Right. No, we still have to do things. Even though we stabilize the temperature, say we stabilize it where it is, or even bring it down a degree or two, because we're now Fifty lever layer, the 1750 level in in terms of heating by using mirrors to compensate for all the greenhouse gases we're put into the atmosphere. Okay, well we're still at we're still now stable, but what does that mean? Is that a a get out of jail free card so that humans can continue making many more humans, mm-hmm. desiring many more things? You know, you can see where this is going. If we could turn back the clock to when there was a when, when there was a billion people instead of eight billion on the planet, this would be a heck of a lot easier to deal with. In fact, we probably wouldn't even have the problem at a billion. 
but ice is just one of the pieces right like yes al oh, albedo yes. albedo is just one of the stabilizing factors a absolutely there are, <laughs> we're doing everything wrong Right, we're we're putting all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and it's not just carbon dioxide. Although that that gets all the news, carbon dioxide. There's 42 others, the most abundant of which is water vapor. And the water vapor positive feedback operates over a span of a few hours or a few days. Right, you heat up the ocean, for example, evaporates water up into the atmosphere, and that serves as a lens to further heat the planet. Because more moisture in the atmosphere it means that it acts more like a magnifying glass and then warms the planet some more. And warms the planet some more, and that puts more water vapor into the atmosphere. And that warms the planet some more, which puts more water vapor. You know, you see where this is going. And that's one of 43. And then there's carbon dioxide and methane and um, 40 more, right, that, that we know about. And so... We have to live very differently or we're going to be right back where we started from in about a week and a half, right? Even if we we so-called fix it, we're, we're still headed down the wrong path on pretty much every other level as well. Because this is like, I mean, in mental health, we talk about balance, right? And living in balance in your mind and in your body. And like the earth, similarly, requires a type of balance, right? in order for it to be sustainable and thrive. And um, I think you've been saying in all of your work that, yo, it's out of balance and uh, it's not gonna end well. I think that's basically what you've been saying, right? If you were to right. give it a punch punchline kind of thing. Right. But, um, so, but there's I several use... factors. <laughs> I don't say yo, but the rest of that yo. is- <laughs> Yo, <laughs> hey, yo, um, but, but there's several but you're factors. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and there there were many pre-civilized societies and current pre-civilized societies that live in relative balance with the other species on the planet. Right? Mm -hmm. This is what indigenous cultures were known for throughout history. And what did we do to indigenous cultures? We destroyed them. Yep. Yeah. Um so I wanted to go down the list a little bit. So Albedo is uh, one of the factors. Um, the Mir project was trying to do something about that. Um, so, but the part about cleaning up the mess or, or adjusting the delicate balance of the chemicals in the atmosphere, paying attention to that is a serious issue. Uh, that's never really come up, right? I guess with the scientists on 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 whole. Right. Well, all I ever see is that the vast majority of humans have to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And this always comes from well-paid people working at universities who spend much of their time jetting around, explaining in conferences how nobody can be jetting around anymore. It's the ultimate gaslighting, it seems like. It's your fault. <laughs> you did it, you little peons. Exactly. You little you know, peons. You did it to yourself. <laughs> and, it, and I know about this because I was one of those people. <laughs> right not that long ago i was going to annual conferences all the time and so you know who am i on the one hand who am i to point fingers on the other hand i realized it was this rabid pursuit of money and the privilege it brings that was driving us to extinction so i opted out right on may 1st 2009 i said i'm not participating in the monetary system anymore that went really well. <laughs> so I stopped accepting paychecks. Holy cow, the rest of the world didn't even notice. Yeah. They would have been nice. It would have been <laughs> nice if they paid attention a little, but I guess yes, if that's I, not if, the way it goes. Yeah. You know, almost all of us spend more than we need to. You know, many people have referred to me as a minimalist and I was not a minimalist until it was forced upon me. <laughs> when, when I stopped accepting paychecks and I didn't have any money, then I was a minimalist. Of course right. I was a minimalist. I had to be. Well, well, it sounds like you you understood things on a different level. So you're like, okay, I'm willing to do like anything. I'll do anything like to try and like turn the ship around. I'll be try to right. be an example. I'll I'll give everything up. Like, just like, look, like, look what I'll do. Look at how wild this is. Like, but they didn't see mostly. Well, um, and I thought they would because I was a reasonably well-known professor, 
right? And <laughs> so I thought people would notice. And then I wrote a couple of books about it, and I really thought people would notice. Nobody reads, <laughs> right? It was only years later I discovered the Bill Hicks routine. Bill Hicks was a stand-up comic who died many years ago, and very young. And he has this routine that the, he's he's at a restaurant, a Waffle House, and the waitress comes up to him and says, what are you reading for? Not what am I reading? What am I reading for? He says, he says, well, I read for a lot of reasons. One of them is so that I don't, don't become, I don't end up becoming a waffle waitress. <laughs> but he was pointing out then, and this was, early 1990s because i think he died in 92 or 93 he was pointing out a long time ago that nobody reads anymore and if if you read you're you're something of a weirdo yes and he was he was pointing that out 30 years ago and Ho howard beale from the network 1977 movie yes remember him he's like yes. read books this is insanity right like get off of the tv I love that guy. Oh, man. Or at least those scenes he's in. Um, so one of the thing, one of the reasons that this ship is not going to turn around is because uh, the wealthy, the elite, and I guess the paid scientists that go, that work with them, they're not willing to address the uh, atmospheric poison issue. They're, or they're not willing to try and come up with some big grand solution to I, I say clean up the mess. Is it is there a better way to put it? It's a no, mess. That's, a, it's... that's absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. We need to clean up the mess. Or the mess is going to clean us up. Or they just say there's no mess there. That's just like <laughs> greenhouse gas. Greenhouse effect, that's a that's a myth. Do they they say but, that too, right? Yeah, but everybody knows better than that by now, don't they? I hope I so. I mean yeah. every every reasonably intelligent person recognizes that we have a real problem with too many greenhouses in the atmosphere. We've right. been hearing about this for a very long time. So the, the world's people, the rich people, even us, even us poor people, like we're not willing to invest right in cleanup like that scale. Well, right. Think about what is required. You have to do something that you don't think anybody else is going to do. We'd all See, have to pay some extra tax or something, right? Or something to pay for and it. Way more than that. Way <laughs> more than that. I thought people would follow my lead because I was relatively successful. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to do it again, I wouldn't. I wouldn't follow my own lead because only after I made that terrible mistake did I find about find out about the aerosol masking effect. And it was only only many years later that work was published in the peer-reviewed literature on nuclear power plants melting down, stripping away stratospheric ozone, and superheating the planet. This is demonstrated in the 2021 film Finch, starring Tom Hanks. And so the writers or the creators of that film know about it, right? Mm -hmm. They know about stripping away of stratospheric ozone and what the consequences are. But we don't seem to be capable of talking about that on any sort of regular basis. I never see the corporate media even mention the idea of nuclear power plants melting down and what that means. What I see instead is the corporate media indicating that we need to go to more nuclear power plants. More, not less, because coal and gas obviously are a bad idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean nuclear is a good idea. <laughs> Tim Garrett at the University of Utah has published five peer-reviewed papers indicating that civilization is the heat engine, no matter how it's powered. Yeah. Civilization is the, the, so this set of living arrangements is going to heat the planet. We have to change this set of living arrangements at a fundamental level. And the governments are trying, aren't they? <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is what I'm saying is uh, I think I think it's governments and churches are both the best at making shit up. So uh, they try and it's pretense, right? So you try and the be, you, you're an ace in both of those domains. If you can make it look like you're doing something when you're not, that's the right. That's how you're an ace in in the politics. <laughs> <laughs> so like all the paper straws that people are complaining about and now in Alberta we're not allowed to use plastic bags they're phasing out plastic bags 
Oh, that's going to solve the problem, right? Like, okay. Oh, yeah. That's in Vermont, too. No plastic bags. No plastic bags. That's going to solve the problem. And and I have to admit that single-use plastic items are horrible, right? Mm -hmm. They're destroying the ocean. They've created these enormous islands in both o in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans now that uh, have completely changed the environment in the ocean. Yeah, yeah, they're through. bad. But it's still a lie, isn't it? Like that it's a, of it's a prob that it's a problem uh, solver. Absolutely, of course it's a lie. We didn't change about four four million things. <laughs> Getting down to at the fun most fundamental levels, I strongly suspect we have to change the way we clip our toenails, or <laughs> all is lost. <laughs> For sure, especially us middle-aged men. Yes, it's getting harder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is so much that contributes to overheating of the planet that we haven't even touched on yet. That it's so, it's so big that it would be difficult to address, much less to get more than 8 billion people in the world to deal with somehow. Right? I think it and would so, be great to come up with the top five or 10 list of the things people aren't willing to talk about honestly and that and and deliver that to COP30 or whatever they're at. Like you people are not talking about these prime these priority issues, the taboo issues, you know. Why are you not why? I think they should be confronted. Whoever's at the top of that organization, gosh, let's send one to Greta. She has a good she has a good uh, reputation with those people, doesn't she? <laughs> yes, she has quite the following. People, some for some reason, people listen to Greta more than Guy. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been kind of wondering about that myself. <laughs> How old is she? Fifteen. Yeah, gosh, she got. You got she's multiple a, degrees, and you were a tenured professor. What the hell? Yeah, I think she, I think she she's over eighteen now. Oh, okay, because it was a big deal when she was no longer a child. Wow. I had my doubts about whether she, she knows more. Grow. She knows more than you do, though, right? Okay. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> do you know how rare it is for somebody with a PhD to become a full professor? No, fewer than one in two hundred people who get a PhD in the natural sciences go on to become full professor. Wow. Okay. Did not this is what does full full professor mean tenure? Or what does that mean? Or... Uh no, you you generally start a tenure track path as you start as an assistant professor, not tenured. And then generally at the six year mark, it's either up or out. You get promoted to associate professor or you get canned. Okay. And and then full professor typically comes about five years after that. And so for most people, this happens if they become full professors, it happens when they're about 45 or so. It happened for me when I was under 40 years of age, which is essentially impossible. But I was, you know, I was so committed. I was so focused on being the Uber professor that that's how I spent my life. And it was enormously costly of course well your mama because, says you had to be your mama said you had to be the best you followed through with it <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> and i believed it and so i just got on this fast track that destroyed so many relationships in my life consequences i guess to trying to be honest <clears throat> i think it's uh one of the philosophers said that if you speak honestly you're going to be detested it's a consequence a natural consequence of Seneca, Plato, I can't remember. But. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. No doubt, because I had people, those people had it going on, right? They could say what they want. And now we look back and they said these incredibly intelligent things, but we don't, still don't pay any attention to them. You know, that was a couple thousand years ago people were saying those smart things and look what we did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yes. Well, the sociopaths took over, so I think that's what happens here in large part. So the right. top five. So one of the big things that people will not talk about or do anything seriously about is to adjust the balance and clean up the mess in the atmosphere. It's not going to happen, almost guaranteed. Um, and then under that, 
Another thing people would have to do if they really wanted to restore balance of the earth, they would we would have to do a massive population reduction willingly, uh, not forced, right? Because that doesn't usually work. People would have to be like all on board and saying everyone would have to kind of get it and go, we need to balance this ship because it's going to tip right. over or whatever, right? Everyone would and have to get it. Is an, exa- an example is when China had a mm-hmm. one child policy mm-hmm. during that single generation of the one child policy the human population of china increased so no you can't force it on people governments can't force these things on people or they'll just find a way around they won't they won't do it so they have to Uh, willingly do it which would mean they would have to understand the predicament right every everybody almost Right. right right absolutely i'm convinced that no matter what the government told people if they if they tried to enforce something, if they tried to force something upon the masses, no matter what it was, people would think it was a bad idea, mm-hmm. right? Oh, so you, you're trying you know, to you're trying to force me to eat ice cream every day. No more <laughs> ice cream ever. <laughs> we become yeah defiant. We become ODD uh, uh, right. <laughs> oppositional, right? <laughs> and so, right now, your subscriber list I think is at about nineteen point seven thousand. So we need to get it up to about five billion. Right. I mean, at least. <laughs> yes. And what that means is I have to change my entire message. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to be more sociopathic, but you're not. So some of these things can't be fixed. So the people of the world would and in addition to just uh, liking to procreate, uh, they would have to probably also give up their religions that suggest that it's good to multiply and replenish the earth. Like they buy into that wholeheartedly, right? Right. So if, they, you, if you if you're if you're going to be married and have a family, you're supposed to have lots of kids in many cases. Not always, but lots of religions do, right? Yes, the Abrahamic religions are defined by their push for more babies, right? I, I don't think any of them are telling people. To have zero or one or even two children it's just no, not the, done. the the happiness is in the big family that's the idea I right think. right that that's the story we're told anyway from the time we're old enough to understand what a story is yep you um, know mm-hmm. norman rockwell look at the norman rockwell paintings they're, they're famous and they don't ever show right one person out alone fishing in a creek or something like that and here's a funny question have you ever tried to change a religious person's point of view have you has anyone listening have you tried like how hard that is like it's impossible (laughs) and how much of the world is in completely indoctrinated in their version of truth right their version of the whatever religion they're in right they're in there they're in there for life in most cases absolutely and I can't say that I have. And and think about it. When you realize how char- how difficult it is to change yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Then try to imagine how difficult it would be to change somebody else. Mm-hmm. Most of us can't even change our own habits. Even when we acknowledge them as being bad for us and bad for our relationships, this is a terrible habit I have, whatever it is. It's very difficult to change. Now, you, now you're going to try to change somebody else especially pursuing something they've they've been doing essentially their entire lives yeah good luck with that so the population issue it would be it seems like it would be even harder than the atmosphere issue to address i think so you know paul ehrlich and his wife ann have been sounding this alarm from a renowned university, Stanford, notably since the 1968 book, Population Bomb, right? Population Bomb came out. That's, that's after, that's, is that before you were born? I was born in 75. Right, there you go. So seven years before you were born, this book comes out and points out that we're in the midst of an overpopulated earth already and we need to do something about it and this was a this was a serious professor paul ehrlich interestingly the publisher wouldn't allow Anne's name to be on the book because women don't know anything about reproduction obviously okay 
So her, so <laughs> even though she co-wrote the book with Paul, her name was not, not on the book. They subsequently wrote more than 30 books together. And they have basically all the same message. They've been trying to reach people since 1968, actually wow. before that. That's a long time. And their message is, all, what is their base message then? Is that? Too many people. Too, too many, many people. people. Too many How, people. And, what is the what is the ideal amount of people? Just curious. Is it like one billion or something? Or? Well, they point out that we probably could sustain the way we live with about a billion people. And the number fluxes a little bit as we gain more information over time. But certainly it ain't it ain't eight. <laughs> eight billion, yeah. Soon eight to rise billion. to ten or twelve, but it's just it's just <laughs> compound compounding. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And 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 I've spoken remotely online, like in this sort of environment with Paul and spoken with him in person about too many people. And he points out very frequently and he has a blog post at the mob blog, Millennium Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere, M-A-H-B. I think it's at mahb.com. And he has an article called Too Many Rich People. So he recognizes that it's not just the number of people, it's also the way those people act. So the problem isn't that we have too many indigenous people, for example. We don't have too many Navajo living on the Navajo reservation. That's not the problem. What we have is too many rich people pursuing too much stuff. And it was that mentality that encouraged me to try to leave the system, right? To opt out of the monetary system. So here's my third thing that I think people would never, ever give up. The American dream. <sighs> yeah. You mean the American nightmare, as George <laughs> Carlin pointed out? It's a nightmare because you have, you have to be asleep to believe it. <laughs> but it's said. been so ingrained. Like yes. even into my head, I'm not even a fucking sorry. I'm not even an American. Like, <laughs> sorry, I want to throw down some f bombs. I'm not even an American. I'm a Canadian, but I like it's like I'm a wannabe American. Like I wanna, or I did, you know. I you're, wanted you're, to be rich and famous like all the other awesome people. <laughs> you're a North American, you know. I I used to really take issue with that word American and applying it to only people in the United States. Because there's North America, there's South America, there's quite a few people who live in America, defined as North America or South America, but the only ones who count are the ones who live in the United States. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. and, and that's just another another way we use language to separate us from one another. Well, I think most Canadians want to be Americans. Like ever since we've been watching your movies. Ghostbusters and Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark and like uh, all the Disney movies, we've been Disneyfied, right? Like <laughs> hypnotized, Disneyfied. Right. We and want to I, be. We want to be you. <laughs> it's pretty interesting because in 1980, I decided that all pop culture was nonsense. So I wasn't going to do any of it anymore. So I stopped watching movies and television series and no comic books and none of that stuff. I just didn't do any of that stuff for a long time. And then when I was on campus, I managed to keep up because students are always talking about it, right? Whatever's the hot item, I hear it 9,000 times every day. So I know what the pop culture topics of interest are. It's just that I wasn't participating. But you can't. You can't avoid it. You can't be immersed in this society and avoid hearing about all of these things, mm -hmm. all, all of which are underlain by the afflictions of every civilization so far. The, the desire for more, the, the desire to separate us from them, racism, misogyny. And there's, there's all these challenges that have been part of every civilization so far and but we're doing it best we're number one come on we're king <laughs> we're king at disney like uh one of the 
types of themes that pisses me off the most is the uh, where the the young the the Cinderella story where uh, she's in poverty and then the rich prince saves her, brings her into the castle, and she lives happily ever after and all the wealth and splendor. I'm pretty sure a lot of people they have absorbed that narrative and they're like, I got to play out that narrative. I got to save. I got to, I got to, we, you know, we got to rescue each other out of poverty, put ourselves into privilege and then live happily ever after. That's what we got to do. Pretty sure I thought that way. <laughs> but what does that mean? What does that, what is half of that? You know, <laughs> once, once you reach a certain income level, not very high above poverty <clears throat> study after study indicates that additional money doesn't make you happier no nope, that people this, are happy disney says it does <laughs> <laughs> disney spend here spend here spend here disney says it does i mean who's got the more powerful marketing campaign disney the churches or us <laughs> i'd put us in third place at this point uh, or wait tenth maybe mm. they got the most powerful marketing ever right machine ever and yes. uh, instead of reading books like you said which is where actual wisdom can be acquired if you read many 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 books um instead we read a single holy book and we watch disney movies and other related media that's what we do and we talk about the next, like you said, the next awesome thing coming out in the media. And then we only get as much schooling as necessary to get a job, I think. Right. I could be, I'm probably being sarcastic on on, on some level here. I'm sure some people like to read books, but on the whole, seriously, you know. <laughs> Yo, what's that mean? <laughs> three people. Three people like to read books. Three people. I thought you were doing, yo, <laughs> something. I'm going to turn you into a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've no doubt that there are people who love to read. My dad loved to read books. He would read, he, he'd get on to an author and he would read all of that author's books just back to back. And it, it was almost all Pulp Fiction. It was just this stuff that I, can't imagine reading one one book, much less a dozen of them. But most people would rather see it on the screen. You know, Bill Hicks did it. That was part of his routine in, in this what are you reading for thing was <laughs> the waitress says, why don't you just watch it on the tube? He says, what do you think I'm reading? Hee-haw? That, <laughs> <book? laughs> that was an old show, Hee-haw. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> like a like kind of a musical show is that right from the 70s Hee-haw? and and i don't know when it was i remember seeing it when i was a kid okay and, and they did little skits and they did music things and it was supposed to be funny but most of the time i didn't understand it because yeah. i wasn't very bright yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think i saw it once when i was very little or something it was replays in the 80s early 80s right right, and, uh, right. yeah 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 Anyway, uh, yeah. Didn't leave a big mark on me. So three big things. People, there's no one's willing to clean up the mess. And, uh, and as a whole, humans as a whole, right, probably would never invest together to do that. Uh, two, the population, people wouldn't willingly agree to reduce the population. Forget it. And their right. religious beliefs would say, forget it. You don't need to. Just believe in God and everything will turn out well. And then three, the American dream, which actually gets us to uh, waste resources as much as possible to become uh, a, a millionaire, only have that temporary embarrassment, right? Right. <laughs> right. And and that was a theme in the first chapter of my first book-length work of social criticism, Killing the Natives. And I described how the American dream started out to be something a lot different than it has turned into. When the phrase was first coined, the American dream, it meant, it meant taking care of everybody, not one person gets all the stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, and, and I have all the documentation to demonstrate this. I don't remember the names offhand now because the book came out when I was a child. So it got kind know. of ba bastardized or ruined, right? That idea. 
And, yes, uh, absolutely. Somehow it got converted to not having the 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 good life for everybody, but instead having the best life for fifteen people. Right. Yeah. Right. And the rest of you screw off. Right, and that's normal and okay and acceptable. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Somehow that's become all the rage. <laughs> So yeah, this has been actually a pretty cool conversation again, I think, and uh, is reminiscent of things we've talked about in the past and how it's been, how it will be likely impossible, I would say 100% impossible, but everyone comes to their own conclusion to turn the boat around. Um, yeah. Um, but to live with that reality, again, I think you need to be working on your mental health. And I just want to reiterate again, uh, my course exists uh, at freebpdcourse.com. Uh, it's a, a combination of work I've been uh, pursuing about my own life and about just understanding mental health and borderline personality disorder. It's like everything I know is in there. And I've also included like 119 links to videos to other professionals who supplement what I say. Um, so, I mean, if you want to strengthen yourself so you can endure these times, um, reach out to resources that are available. And that's one. So. That's that's great, Peter. I appreciate you saying that. And again, there will be a link just beneath this video and also in my blog post at GuyMcPherson.com pointing you toward this free course that Peter is offering. So thank you for that. And let's wrap it there and look forward to doing this again in a, in a few days. Sounds good.